Uh, what, what are you working on over there, Pruitt? Oh, uh, just a, a summoning spell for something called a Trogdor Burninator. I'm gonna give it a go. That seems really complicated, man. We're, we're just supposed to be brushing up on the D&D spell schools for today. Are those rude? You're right. What, what Transmutation might be a little easier. Transmutus Burninatus. <laughs> Transmutation is easier. <laughs> Can you say WebDM? David. And I'm Jonathan Pruitt, and today we're doing transmutation on WebDM. Transmutation, Jim Davis. The school of the alchemists. The school of those who wish to turn uh, lead into gold to shape uh, the human soul and perfect it from its imperfection uh, at a point of creation to exaltation later. To make symmetrical that which was previously uh, A. It's a uh, big tent school. It's like evocation, it's like conjuration. And many of the things yeah. that we said about evocation, we could also say about transmutation. And when we get to it, conjuration. PHB says its ability is to alter the properties of an object or a creature or something like that. Yeah. It can render enemies harmless by turning them into furry little animals. You know, bolster your allies, um, make objects move of their own accord, and then also has this the idea of, of, of innate healing, of enhancing the, the healing and restorative powers of things to uh, to make them magical yeah and th that's already like all over the place but it's also thematically appropriate is one of my favorite schools right like there's a, just so much going on here and so many spells to love much like I think you could with evocation if you just like focused on mm -hmm. evocation right you'd be just fine sure because yeah, it yeah. covers enough in transmutation I think is like a close second to that yeah yeah, uh, yeah because I mean you're talking about movement you're talking about like you said healing defense I mean a lot of offense right what, not, maybe not direct damage dealing, even though there is some. There's some, oh yeah, sure. You could be sort of a blaster type, mm -hmm. but there's also like crowd control and uh, the, you know buffing yourself, buffing your allies. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's more well-rounded uh, than, than sort of like focused in any one particular direction. And so I see like transmutation as being the, the school that's, um, I mean, all of them in some way are, are quintessentially magical, right? But the scene that I, I think of when I think of transmutation is the scene I think many people do when they think of like polymorphing and shape changing and altering yourself is the fight between, um, what was it, Mad Mim and Merlin in Sword in the Stone? Oh. Uh, the marvelous Mad Madam Mim. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the, uh, you know, turning into a crocodile and a hippo and a dino and a germ and, and, and that sort of like adaptation but also uh, raw magical power is what uh, what really appeals to transmutation uh, for me think of a, a wizard that becomes a were creature and mm. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry I'm bumping ahead to concepts, no, no, no yeah it's fine. But yeah like I feel a going. wizard that can basically be a were creature but they do it Solely through magic, right? An animist, an animage, yeah. or something. Oh, like yeah. That. yeah. In, in Harry Potter, you'd, you'd be an, an no. animagus. <laughs> when I sit down and really dig into transmutation, and there's mm -hmm. a lot to love and a lot to sort of like look at with uh, with a side eye, uh, and, and spells that are worth thinking about, I, I come away with the impression that this is the soldier school of magic. Oh yeah. And soldier in the Roman legionnaire sense, right? The engineer as a soldier, where spade and and pickaxe are as important as spear and sword. And this is the one where you've got spells that are gonna move the earth, they're gonna entrench things or break holes in walls. This is the kind of magic that you want present at a siege or a civil engineering project. That's where my head goes when I think of transmutation. You wanna be able to purify food and water. I'm sorry. Oh, sure. <laughs> you wanna be able to purify food and water. You wanna be able to dig a trench in a minute, yeah. you know, or undermine a wall in mm -hmm. less time than that, you know, or the vice versa, you know, pile up some dirt moving around. How real is reality in your world? Like that's something that, that DMs and players need to think about, right, mm -hmm. Jim? I mean like if you're talking about real world physics and like how things are manipulated, mm -hmm. like where's the, where is the line for you? Dungeons and Dragons describes a a wholly and 100% magical world. So you'll see uh, Jeremy Crawford sometimes talk about the background magic of D&D or other designers of Dungeons and Dragons talking about the innate magic of the setting. And I take that to mean that when they say something like, you know, the, the planes of energy and, and elements exist here, 
that those aren't symbolic, that those don't represent anything, you know, other than what, what they say they do, which is that fire comes from this place. It doesn't follow the laws of thermodynamics necessarily, or if it does, there's a, an overlap, but it does behave differently, yeah. right? Because we can conjure fire without any fuel. Same with a lot of other things, gravity and, and uh, time and distance and space and all of these things that if you were to be bound by them, a lot of the spells wouldn't work or they would work very differently. The implications of them would need to be figured out. And so I see it more as um, the world of a D&D setting is purely magical and any, uh, any appearance of fidelity to real world physics or a scientific uh, understanding of the world is purely coincidental. Mm -hmm. um, I blur that line deliberately in Land Between Two Rivers by having the, sci the magic known as science uh, <laughs> present in the world, but um, it's super science with an exclamation point in all caps. You know, it's not science. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but you could go the opposite route, right? Like you could have a magic system that was about manipulating the, phys the laws of physical reality as we know them, and mm -hmm. it could still be really fun and interesting, right? Oh, most definitely. But I, I think that the transmutation school as is, would be the closest to uh, kind of attaching on to that. Right. That, that, that kind of fidelity to real world physics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because, I mean, that is what is, it is supposed to be, right? Is, is you are altering that which is right. into something else. So how about for yourself? Because you run a game that's set primarily in space. And, mm -hmm. and for you, you're, you have a, I would describe you, between the two of us, you're the science guy. I am the science guy. Sh sure, I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> Um, More than me. <laughs> <laughs> we, we took a vote. Um, two to zero. We can only have one. Uh, <laughs> yes. With Highlanders and scientists, there can be only one. I like to remain um, faithful to the original intent of Spelljammer, mm. which was it was an under, a flawed understanding of science. Mm. It was a conceptual space in which the Greeks lived where they were like, Oh, this is the way it could be because of this is what we see. Oh, sure. When you need a telescope, but you're only looking through a peephole, mm -hmm. things are going to look a little off, right, and you're not right. going to get a, the clear picture. And so I like that. You know, I mean, as far as like celestial bodies and how they move and things like that, how you act near them, it, you know, it, it. I don't. I don't try to be too close to it. Like. Mm. Um, yeah, that would be better for the conjuration show. <laughs> Never mind. Save for another show. Yeah, well, I'll, I, I'll I save that example I, for I another show. I feel you on show. that one. But yeah, I, I, but I yeah. see what you mean. Like, because it's it is one of those things where if, if if you do start taking into account the limits of of you know reality as we understand them, then it can be create problems for the dungeon master. And just like running a mm -hmm. game makes it difficult. Um, and so that's why I fall on the this is a magical world, and you know players might use uh, uh, their understanding of of the laws of reality to inform their choices in it, but the characters don't really have an understanding of. That. And I also find attempts to like rationalize the effects of spells using the science, you know, using the laws of science as one of those where I'm like, I, I, I like, the, come on. And you see that defense come up a lot in uh, like on, in the online uh, discussions where it's like, oh, it's an elf game. Or, you know, like, I'm not concerned about this kind of realism when there's dragons and magic and other kind of things. And I, I think that impulse is, you know, a fine impulse to go on, but it's also worth teasing out and playing with and, and thinking about and really thinking about your campaign world and going like, all right, how does this world that I have interact with all of these planes where all of this magical energy is coming from and all of these casters can manipulate it and call it forth and change it and shape it and alter it? Like, what's the underlying structure there? You know, maybe the players will never understand, but you might have a transmuter who is playing with these forces and therefore has an understanding of them and it's worth considering or if you're the kind of dungeon master like I am, just letting the player come up with all that themselves. <laughs> you know, just pony oh, yeah. up. And it's your caster. Like, what do you think? Yeah, they, <laughs> you know? they present their thing, and I'm like, yep, that's exactly how it works. Right. You sure, know? bingo. Oh, yep. Right the first time. Yep, dragons have a third <laughs> lung that has a lighter-than-air molecule, and right. that's how they combine it with something else to create there fire, but it's also how they fly. Oh, my God. There, there you go. go. That's where I kind of leave it, because it, it leaves the door open for a lot of uh, interesting things that you can do. Yeah, yeah and those interesting things are... Uh, are spells. Spells, yes. What are some of your favorites? We I mean, you don't have to go through all of them. Right, but there, right. There, but there are some standouts uh, in the transmutation school that can allow these transmuters to uh, change the very forces of nature. I mean, I think the big ones are uh, are the, the, the ones that change your shape or the shape of someone else, the polymorph, true polymorph, animal shape. Looking at the cantrips, Mold mm -hmm. Earth is, is a favorite. Just because it's a, a simple little thing, a kind of spell that you might overlook, 
that you might say like, I, I'm not gonna take this spell, this is just yes. silly or something like that. It doesn't do damage, it, it doesn't have a flashy effect. But if you think about for a second what that spell represents and the amount of, say, man hours it saves. It's a labor-saving device in the same way that, say, prestidigitation is, or a labor-saving spell in that case. But it's one that has specific applications to, the to environments that adventurers often find themselves in. So how many, you know, how many times do you need to just like dig around uh, in the dirt? Or how many times do you need to uh, you know, mold your environment in some way? Uh, this is the cantrip that allows you to do that, allows you to interact with the environment in that way. And it's also one where if you have enough time, you can get away with a whole bunch of shit. <laughs> well, and I love the um, you know. <laughs> I love the uh, the aspect of mold earth because you can like build like shapes and basic right. shapes and stuff. And it's like, how many times do you have like that scene where you have to get ready for the mission? <laughs> you got the you got the whoever over on the side with mold earth. It's like, all right, we're gonna come down through second building. That's when you come out in but the just, cart. <laughs> I can just now picture a scene where it's that, and then of course someone else wants to get in, and they've got like say a minor illusion cantrip to spice uh -huh. it up a bit, and now you've spent more time describing the planning of your heist than you have. And that's why uh -huh. you're playing. You well, know, that's the Dungeons and Dragons moment right there. And then the person that is yeah. watching you, uh, scrying on you that you're about to break into, they literally get to watch your plan unfold. For sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how the villain knew everything. <laughs> I'm also a big fan of Thorn Whip. Crowd control, movement spell, mm -hmm. uh, I like that. Uh, moving up, Expeditious Retreat, fun spell. You know, unlocking a bonus action at the cost of concentration. I, I love it for, um, Something like Eldritch Knights, uh, or some you know a, a class like fighter that's traditionally rather slow, doesn't move very quickly. It Eldr doesn't usually have like a bonus action. It's a good spell for that, um, or something like say a ranger, you mm -hmm. know, who would have access to it a little earlier. The big ones though for me are the big spells like Polymorph it is an iconic transmutation spell, and also one of those that causes dungeon masters a lot of headaches. It changes the dynamic of a, of a group, and particularly once you hit uh, eighth level and you start seeing dinosaurs regularly in your uh, sessions as various members of your party or otherwise are turned into T-Rexes or Allosauruses and things like that. It can get to a lot of players and dungeon masters and it like I said it changes things for them and so it's a spell that I, I, I I'm not thinking about taking out it's it, being able to turn someone into a newt or transform yourself into something that's powerful and, and advantageous for that moment is a iconic ability consider ways that you can uh, rein it in if it is causing problems for your players yeah, or yourself, yeah. rather. No, I, I completely understand that. Being able to either take uh, an enemy off the board, yeah. which recently in Star Wars Bound, I got to do that with the big badass barbarian oh, sure, yeah, yeah. Mm. And, and turn them into a sheep. Uh -huh. And they did not like that. <laughs> but it's like polymorph other. I mean, you know, hey, have yeah. fun with that. But I like looking at the, uh, what I like to call the more Disney transmutation. The things like Tiny Servant. Oh, yes. Uh, animate Object. <laughs> Awaken. You can have talking animals. I mean, you right. can have your animal companion. Mm -hmm. 30 days of them where they're sort of like charmed by you. They're charmed they're by charmed you, but I mean, obviously, you know, you, if you're going to go through the effort to awaken an animal, you're going to treat it well. At least I, so. I, I would I would think so. Because you want that animal to follow you around, you, you put some investment into it. But thinking about the idea of bestowing consciousness onto an animal and like the ramifications of that, I think it's one of those spells where it's like, I mean, it's fifth level. Right. I mean, this is the stuff of like, you, you're now touching like almost like small g, but godhood. Right, right, right. But fifth level spells, you're getting them at ninth level, which is right there before the halfway mark of Dungeons and Dragons. And is also, you're entering into the territory where the, the game just sort of changes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, being able to bestow consciousness and, and to be able to, mm -hmm. to uplift uh, a creature is uh, is a powerful thing and shouldn't just be taken lightly. Uh, there's a lot of things about the D&D magic system that if you just are flippant with the consequences of it or just hand wave them away, it can seem like these spells are overpowered and and you know your casters are out of control. Chances are there are uh, in-game or in-setting things that you can do to let them know that their spells, they have consequences when you cast them. Awaken mm -hmm. is one of those, right? Like, yeah, oh, yeah, what does that animal do once they're no longer charmed? H how do they live in the world? What, you know, are they just supposed to go back to being an animal? If you could now talk and like have like some intelligence mm -hmm. to your thought processes, yeah. what would it be like if you were a deer that, you know, you're Rudolph and you got awakened by Santa? Are you going to go back to the <laughs> other 
the other reindeer in the forest that don't talk. It doesn't really work as a metaphor since they all talk. Since they all talk, they were all magical. They were all awakened, with, right? I, you know, you can join like the Emerald Enclave or something like that. Hopefully, the other person that awakened you is like a druid, and you like just hanging out with them. Maybe you like chill out at their grove or something. I, those spells like that are really uh, are, are really interesting because they do have consequences. They change something about the game world. Mm-hmm. Tiny Servant was one you mentioned though, right? And Tiny Servant is a, a new one from Xanathar's, right? And it's an interesting spell because it's literally like I point at that potted plant and this couch over here. You know, like maybe not the couch, but you know, a little desk chair. It's a little comfort on the go, though. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's just eight hours of this creature that sort of follows you around, obeys you. It, mm-hmm. It's like the little things from Beauty and the Beast, just the little knickknacks around the house. I make these miniatures all get up and, and walk around. Pee Wee Herman was a transmuter. Oh my God, <laughs> it certainly was. Oh jeez, <laughs> I can't get out of my head now. The word is transmutation. <laughs> <laughs> Tiny Servant also melds into like animate objects, Yeah. which is a fun sort of like damage enhancing spell uh, that you can get in uh, for mid-range from transmutation. So there's a lot of stuff going on and obviously transmutation has telekinesis with it. So oh, yeah. There's all those effects that come along with it. Telekinesis, well, reverse ga- gravity. Reverse those, gravity. Those things, yeah. When you're controlling the fundamental forces of nature. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, I, I do love that. Another odd one I, I like, I don't know why, sequester. Ooh, it's, it's one of those spells that I think is a strong case for there being multi-school spells mm-hmm. because it covers a variety of effects. I, I like the, the effect of it, right? Like being able to just remove this thing from the world. Like I'm just going to... It's just going to yeah. be tucked over here. The run, one ring, ring huh? Yep, yep, yep. Let's yep. go ahead and there just sequester go. this. I'm going to put that over there. Throw it in a ravine. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a powerful world-building spell because what if you find the location of it? What if mm-hmm. you stumble upon one of these objects or places or whatever it is that's been sequestered? What if uh, you're seeking after one? Mm-hmm. and the, need... the diary of the transmuter that, that right, hid yeah. it away. Mm-hmm. ton of stuff. And that's, you know, the, that involves now the research downtime activity and, and adventures themselves. And so you can take spells like this, a spell like Sequester or Awaken and build something on it Mm -hmm. and have it uh, impact your world and and drive part of your adventure through just like playing out the implications of this spell. I mean, you can do that or or cast Regenerate on somebody. So uh, just let them re-roll them, right? They'll get back to Regenerate in in the concept section. Yeah. Do you have any other spells that you want to to touch on and you want to move into some concepts? Some concepts. There's a couple of spells I wouldn't mind touching on with Transmutation. Two of them for me are are Tensor's Transformation, which I like the idea of this spell. But the fact that it only lasts 10 minutes and one of the benefits of casting it, getting uh, proficiency in armor, specifically like heavy armor, uh, because you're probably probably don't have the decks to wear the lighter armors uh, that you would get proficiency in, if you're a wizard casting it at least, is that you it takes 10 minutes to put on the armor. <laughs> and so it's, it's, it's a, I, I, it is one of those things where I, I'm like, part of doing the spell series the way we have and like looking at the spell schools over time and not just doing them all at once is that my thoughts and opinions have sort of uh, evolved as we've looked at these. But I still, there are some inconsistencies that really bother me. And this one is one that's just like, come on guys, this is a six level spell. Like it can't last an hour, you know, at least, right? Like now I can get, you know, I can put it on, I get 50 minutes uh, of, of, uh, of heavy armor, tensor tra- tensor's transformation sort of thing. Yeah. But then I started thinking like, it's a six level spell. Why doesn't this spell just summon magical armor for me and I have like a Sailor Moon style transformation <laughs> scene <laughs> as, right, as it yeah. summons weapons and armor and, and other things to my side because this is the spell that turns the wizard into a warrior and I, I think it's appropriate for that. Who cares that it has a conjuration effect to it? So so what? Like, yeah. the spell schools are suggestions and thematic. They're not hard <laughs> and fast. Anyway, the Tensor's Transformation. I would change one of those two things about it. The other one for me is Glibness. It's eighth, like eighth level. It's a, right? It's a... I mean, it... it, it it's basically an eighth level you can lie to anyone. Right. It establishes a floor for your deception check, For your charisma basically. checks. Yeah. Right, yeah. And that being 15, and then you can't, uh, your lies cannot be magically detected or, or sniffed out. And I'm looking like, is it for an eighth level spell? I want it to be like, for the next hour, anything you say, everyone will believe it. Like, no check needed. You're the most outlandish lie, the most implausible fiction. These gullible rubes will eat it right up. Mm-hmm. And then your hour's over, and it all comes flooding back. <laughs> the lie is revealed, and yeah, whatever you could get away with in that hour, you got away with. And that's a powerful 8th level spell. 
right? You can do a lot of damage with that spell. You can bring a kingdom down with that. You can that. bring a kingdom down with that spell. As well you should, it's 8th level. But I, I find that if you want the effect that it has 6th level, 5th, what do you think? I, it's something lower. Something lower than that, <laughs> right. Like maybe one of the ones where you don't just get one of those slots. Right, one of those spell levels where it's more like, oh yeah, you get a couple of these a day. That's where I feel about glibness, uh, and, and and you know I can see, yeah, it would completely bowl over a, a, any number of social encounters, but I, I think that's appropriate for an eighth level spell, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, think so. I mean, the fact that you it still can be detected non magically with just an insight check. Technically, that's the way it is because it says it even magically yeah. can be detected as a lie, but. Maybe I, I need to that. look at the spell again. Yeah, I can see that there. But I mean, like, okay, so let's, if you've got like a 15 and then you, you're, you know, let's say you're a bard, right? And you've got uh, expertise in several of the charisma skills. Mm -hmm. uh, you've maxed out your charisma itself. You're looking at like, what, a plus, anywhere from like a plus 10 to 12 for your check. Mm -hmm. And so you're looking at hitting scores with glibness that are well past the insight checks that people are going to throw well, against you, right? Unless you're dealing with I mean, another similarly yeah, specialized say, insight. You're casting 8th level spells, so you're going to be going up against dragons and oh, yeah. higher higher uh, CR creatures. Mm -hmm. that a lot of those little... would need to be m m altered by the DM to have that. But yeah, you're right though, right? Like I think a dragon should have a, a crazy insight check. You know, yeah. They are ancient creatures of great power power and wisdom. I can see that, but for practical purposes, like, usually the low 20s is all you really need to hit for DCs and with, with, with your uh, skill proficiencies. And so, like, to me it seems like overkill. If you're going to roll a die like that, or you're going to have it be that it's always 15, why don't you just be like, yeah, everybody believes you for an hour. Whatever it is, they believe you. Yeah. And I think that's a lot more fun as a spell. Like, you can do a lot of just stupid things with that. <laughs> Just call the spell liar. Right. Deception. <laughs> Davis's delicious face. deception. You should make your own spell, Jim Davis. I have, I've made many spells. <gasps> anyway, concepts. Concepts. If you want to be a Disney princess mm -hmm. out there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you need to be some kind of transmuter. Sure. And I've already touched on that with the tiny servants, mm -hmm. you know, waking all the animals around all the you. Animals. Mm -hmm. Maybe Snow White should have had purify food and drink ready. Okay, yeah. But, you know, it could have helped. It sure would have. Just right. saying. Uh, but it's just, I don't know, for me, it, like, I think of that. Now, the other concept I have is the fact that the story of Jesus, he was a transmuter. He's walking on water. He's, uh, he's pass walling. Okay. He pass walled to get out of the tomb. All right, okay, all right. Okay. Okay, all right. Regeneration. Put Regeneration. years back on. Putting years back all right. I mean, it's all there. So pro, it's, this is coming from an strong, a-religious person. Building a but, strong case. And also speak with plants. He went out in the Garden of Gethsemane to just hang out. Nah, you know, he's probably, he was probably talking to the plants. Sure. You know, sure. if God's everywhere. Then you're, yeah, okay. Then he's in the plants. Mm -hmm. This is how, uh, you know, myths and legends get formed, there, uh -huh. right? Like all these things. All right, okay. Mm -hmm. There's your sort of semi-divine, maybe, maybe your character's like uh, wandering the highways and byways of your campaign setting. Performing semi miracles and pissing off the religious folk. You know, I'm, that I'm, kind I'm of telling thing. you, man, you make a divine soul sorcerer. <laughs> that way you can get the, you oh, get yeah, the yeah. clerical and the, the sorcerer yep. uh, transmutation yep. spells. Take your favorite, yeah. And then just you just and then you make then you make a, a deity. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna do this now. You're gonna do. You're making a character now. <laughs> I'm gonna make a character. It's like no, no, no. I am a god. You know, I'm not the god, but I'm a god. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, Pro I, prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. I, <laughs> there was a, a one character that someone played in a, and this is a complete off-tangent, had nothing to do with transmutation whatsoever, mm. uh, in a Planescape game where they were a god of themselves. Like, like I'm yeah. the first one. I believe in myself. I can fly. <laughs> when I think of concepts for transmuter, I think of, like, what does transmutation magic, like, represent? It yeah. represents the altering of, of, of substances and things, of properties of things. And so yeah. that's a kind of person, regardless if they're a wizard, a sorcerer, a a cleric or druid, whatever you know, specific flavor of magic they practice and how they do it. They're a person that sees the world in a state of flux. That there's nothing yeah. permanent about the world. That there's nothing that uh, is fixed. All of it is up for grabs. We can change everything yeah. about this. Everything is becoming something else from moment to moment. That's very uh, pre-Socratic uh, Greek philosophy kind of thing. You could dig deep into if you wanted to. You know, you would be someone who sees, uh, you know, this table as, as just a suggestion of its possibilities. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it has an infinite number of possibilities. And with the right magic, we can unlock that. So maybe the transmuter is an eternal optimist. Uh, someone who's also always on the go.
go, always thinking, always doing something, uh, letting their magic shape sort of who they are uh, in, in terms of their personality. That's, that's sort of the first thing that I think of. When I get into that, I, I touch on the fact that transmutation is sort of like alchemy, which is a mystical tradition from uh, you know, our own world and our own campaign setting that we find ourselves in right now. Yeah. Uh, and, and the idea there is that you turn lead into gold, but that it's a metaphor for the purification of the human soul. Yeah. And so you go through these four alchemical uh, reactions and the process of learning those alchemical reactions and mastering them is also the process by which you master yourself and go from like an impure, imperfect uh, spirit because this is you know all tied up with Christianity and medieval and early modern stuff. It's you know, because you're a sinner and bad and all that other thing. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to turn yourself into something pure and good. What if you take that concept sort of literally with your transmuter and you almost kind of borrow a little bit from the monk. There's a little bit of flavor there from the monk, right? Mm -hmm. of, of, of mastery of the self. Now your uh, magic is all uh, a reflection of the perfection of your character as they progress. And handily enough, D&D has a leveling system, which means they'll get more powerful the longer they go on. And mirrors that process uh, pretty well. And maybe their magic comes from within. It's, it's not external spells, but it's just the manipulation of, of their own internal energies that uh, can produce these effects. They can make things move just by thinking about them. And this is sort of a way that you can shift your focus on the D&D &D magic system and go away from like magic is a spell slot thing that I use and a spell is a discrete thing to just a spell is an effect that's produced by something. And my transmuter just happens to have mastered themselves to the point that they can, you know, change their shape. They can make themselves run faster. They can jump higher. They can levitate. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they can move between dimensions, like through blink, or, or you know, uh, can imbue uh, part of their energy into other things, and, yeah. and, and for temporarily. And that's a very different kind of caster than one that masters spells and does things. I Maybe mean, that's more like a sorcerer type. Oh, I was going to say, uh, far be it for me to not interject a pop culture reference, but it sounds like the $6 million man to me. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. We can make him faster. We can make him stronger. Right. I had a, a, an NPC in Lamb Between Two Rivers recently, uh, Anders, a Vivamancer, and I used transmutation as the basis for it. And I, I because I was create, creating a custom spell list and, and really like a custom caster, I was borrowing heavily from Druid's spell list as well, uh, it mixed it with the uh, transmutation from Wizard. And all of the spells there were, were, were things that were like, uh, you know, Primal Savagery is a good example of that. Like he can grow claws because he's a vivimancer, a life mancer. He masters the biology of it. Uh, speaking of whether or not it's scientific or not, he, he sees it from a pseudoscientific way and would describe it as a partial science that he manipulates with magic. And it also means like, well, I just grow organs for myself, which gives me haste, right? Like I grow my adrenaline gland <laughs> to the point, you know, my, mm -hmm. that it, it, it's oversized and overclocked. But for that period of time, it, yeah. it gives me this boost. Yeah, water breathing gives you gills. All the spells are shape-changing spells. And mm -hmm. so when you get to something like polymorph or, or, or something, then it's really just like, yeah, well, I was already just altering myself. Invisibility is me just turning my skin uh, reflective so that it mirrors the environment around me. You know, if I stand still, you can't really see me, you know, and if I move, you can maybe try, but you've got disadvantage, that kind of thing. So that's how I presented that, the vivamancy of it. And that's a just, all of that's just reflavored. In this case, some of it was druid magic, but you could do that with a, um, you know, from a PC, and it's just reflavored uh, spells that you describe differently. That's mm -hmm. it. Kind of touched on there at the end, uh, the, the whole shapes, shape uh, yes. shifting the shape aspect. Shape shifting aspects of the spells. Because that's yeah. a big, it's yeah. a big draw for transmutation. It's kind of the, it's to me, I mean, it is kind of the crown jewel, right? Right, right, right. So the shape shifting spells start with alter self, and then goes to polymorph, and ends with like shape change, true polymorph, and mass polymorph. I think the issues that arise from there, uh, partly it's because there's. A, the CR system is not a good one-to-one -one for character level. No. And the way these spells work is usually they turn you into a creature of a certain CR or turn a creature into an equivalent creature of the same CR. Polymorph does this with just beasts. You know, there's the big bruiser over there and I'd like to lay on this polymorph on them or more likely like here's the wimpy caster who doesn't have a great con save <laughs> that will uh, land a polymorph on and you know, you turn him into a sheep or a frog or something like that, lasts for an hour. When you use it on an ally, and now all of a sudden you're taking something that had a CR and turning it into another equivalent CR. You're going like, well, I'm taking this eighth level party member and casting Polymorph on them 
And now I'm looking at CR8 creatures and going like, well, there's a whole bunch of stuff here. I, I think it, it, the fact that they're not quite a, a one-to-one match leads to a lot of problems. And so you'll see things like using, say, uh, you know, a bunch of pixies that you've either conjured or otherwise to cast polymorph on you leads to a lot of headaches for dungeon masters. Or like maybe the first time that your players break out double T-Rexes because you've got a druid and a wizard in the party <laughs> and you've got two polymorphs going on that it, it, it just sort of like, whoa. Uh, and maybe you read the spell and you see that there's not a lot of guidelines for what you're supposed to do. It's yeah. like they're not their character anymore, but they retain their personality and their alignment. But they have the stats of the animals. So what does that mean for, say, really low intelligence animals? Like how much of your personality is based on your character's mental stats? versus just how you play them, um, how much of that is based on their alignment. It's worth sitting down at, before this spell gets used and just talking through that with the people who are going to be casting it and the people who are going to be uh, the recipients of it and just seeing, like, what does this mean? What does it mean for you to take on the aspects of this creature? Are you a mindless beast for you know the duration of the spell and you just are sort of pointed at the enemy and then they shut the door and then once they stop hearing the roaring, that's when they come in. Uh, that's one way to play it. The other way is like you have a pet T-Rex, a pet dinosaur, or a giant ape, or any other number of, of large beasts. Right, no, you know. <laughs> Right. And it's only going to get more as there are more uh, monster books that get released, and the more monster manuals that you have on hand, there's more mm -hmm. creatures. This was the problem with like druid wild shaping and the like in, in say, 3rd edition. Every book that comes out has new things they can turn into. It's the same with sort of uh, these spells, is, is every... Uh, Every new monster mail that's released is potential for not polymorph in terms of beasts, but shape change, true polymorph, the higher level spells, you can turn into practically anything. Pretty much turn <laughs> anything into anyone. Animal Shapes is up next. That's sort of the eighth level spell. And yeah. that's the one where it's like you start looking at, the, the, say, the druid who can cast animal shapes. And, a, and a, you know, a druid that walks into town is collecting stray dogs and stray cats and little rats and birds and sparrows until they're followed by a throng that they've been using animal friendship on, and now all of a sudden they've got, you know, saber-toothed tigers and flying, you know, giant flying eagles and things like that. Animal shapes is fun. I like it. I really like it. <laughs> yeah. What is it? Any any creature you can see within 30 feet? Any willing how, creature within 30 feet. How many birds can you collect and just be God, on the branches? How many sparrows fit in that sphere? That Plus all the moles and little things you can have. I don't know. Maybe you have to see them all. Anyway, I think you do have to be able to see them. It is a spell that if you're a player and you plan on casting this, please let your dungeon master know ahead of time because there's a lot. This could like completely bring a game to a halt. Uh, and it is eighth level magic, right? Like sometimes that happens at that at that level of play, but you know, you can uh, give them a heads up <laughs> through that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> On to ninth level. Ninth where level. Right, these are the three quarters ones. of the right. spells. Right. Of ninth level of spells. Ninth level are changing, yeah. Mass polymorph, uh, up to 10 creatures, uh, and they don't have to be willing, can be turned into uh, uh, beasts. It's that scene in Willow, the army the army of good, led by Mad Mardigan and Finn Rizel, is camped outside of Bab Morda's castle, and she's like, they're not soldiers, they're all pigs. But she's casting from her lair so she can get more creature types than just the 10 that the spell would allow you to. That's this right here, it's just like, no, you're all just pigs. You know, like you're nothing. And I like that. That kind of application of turning a hero into an hel a helpless animal is such a villainous act. It's so classically villainous that when I can do it to multiples, it's just like, ooh, that's delicious. I, just, mm -hmm. I really like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's worth that ninth level slot. Yeah. <laughs> Having ham for dinner and bacon for breakfast. Right. There we go. That was the Pixies letting us know that it was time to... Uh, Time to stop talking about their polymorph abilities. Um, <laughs> the other ones are shape change, right? Which yeah. is the big one, right? You, and, and it allows you to keep uh, class features, race features, even though you're turning into something different. Um, and, and it's the one that you sort of cast on yourself. It's sort of a self buff. It's a big spell, right? Like you're giving up a lot there, but you can turn into a, a, a great number of things and keep your features. And if you can otherwise cast spells in your new form, then you can here too. It's yeah. a great spell. Like it's one of my favorite spells, as it should be. It's ninth level, right? Like Yeah, it's, it doesn't get much higher than this Yeah, without homebrewing. Yeah. But we'll get to that. But we'll get to that at, some, at a future date. <laughs> uh, and then True Polymorph, what I love about True Polymorph is not just that you can cast it and turn objects into creatures, creatures into objects, but that if you concentrate for the full duration, it lasts until dispelled. And to me, True Polymorph is now touching upon the magnitude of magic that when I think of magic, it's this. It's True Polymorph. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that was a couch. I turned it into a lion, and I'm just going to think about that for an hour. 
Now it'll be that way until someone else comes along and undoes that magic. And then you awaken it. And then it has to deal with the fact that a dispel magic is all it's going to take to turn it back into a couch. You know, that could be a moment for your campaign. Would it still be an awakened <laughs> couch? I, well, I would say no, because it's no longer a lion uh, when it's a couch. But that's a question for philosophers and dungeon masters, uh, if it happens to, to just, occur in your night. I'm just trying to figure out how, how Pee Wee did spells. it. That's all I'm trying to figure out is how Pee Wee did it. Clearly there's a spell that's not that's like above Tiny Servant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's like, you know, uh, huge, huge Helper. Yeah. <laughs> huge Helper. Here's a spell that's not in the canon of D&D Magic. And okay. you can't play like Plastic Man, Dalzim, Mr. Fantastic. You can't stretch. Right, you're not stretching, elongating, turning yourself into a spring. Although you could reflavor a lot of these spells and get that, you know. It's jump, you, re you just turn your legs into springs. Yeah, your legs actually yeah, extend like yeah. out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of totally can do that. We could continue just bullshitting for, any, for well past 40 minutes, but yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Head on over to Patreon for our weekly podcast and so much more. WebDM is also on Twitch with three weekly games, which we upload to WebDM Plays, our second YouTube channel. Can you say Kitty? Kitty. That's, can you say Gwen? That's Gwen. That's Drist. All right, we're rolling. Let me frame it up and then we're ready to go. That's Travis. It is. Can you say Helm's Deep? Helm's Deep. By Games Workshop. Oh, what's so. up? Games? Can, can you say Games? Games. Workshop? And games. Workshop. There you go.